need to know about me. One is, I haven't preached a sermon in a few years, in, a, in about a year, because we have gone to a smaller crowd and we've done small group Bible studies. Um, so this is a pleasure. Um, however, I was standing over there and I suddenly felt like ready, like a preacher again. So um, those of you who are in the ministry know what I mean. Um, also, I am an interactive preacher at some points. In other words, I believe that preaching isn't just me standing up here talking and you listening. Sometimes it's a conversation. So you mean sometimes you interact with me? Sometimes. That was not one of those times. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Harsh. Um, when I was in uh, seminary, when I first got here, we were in my theological field education class, and uh, somebody said, uh, they were talking about a lot of black preachers who were in the room. And, you know, the black preachers have the call and response at their church. If you have ever been, never been to an African American church, go. It's an experience that you'll never regret, you'll never forget. Um, they talk back to each other. And I said, well, I don't have that, but I, I do have pictures. They're like peppers? Yes, I have people who will share. I have people who will share uh, things in the middle of the sermon. Uh, sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's a uh, laugh. Sometimes it's a very spiritual point. They're like, the guy got really serious and he leaned over the table and he goes, "You don't discipline them? <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? Have them sit next to the deacons? They are the deacons." <laughs> so. Um, this place forced me to be more interactive, and, uh, I, and I'm okay with that, and Jesus is okay with that. So I have, so I'm going to start off with a question that I want you to answer. <laughs> when you hear the word perfection, what do you think about? When you think of something that's perfect, what is perfect? Flawless. Flawless? What? God? Okay, without preaching my sermon. <laughs> I'm just Anything else? That's what I think. Okay. Right. Yes. Diamonds. Being without blemish. Being without blemish. Okay. Beyonce. Complete. Complete. Beyonce. What did you say? Beyonce. Beyonce is perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you said something like that. Huh? Nothing. Nothing is perfect. Okay. Open up your Bibles to the Sermon on the Mount. For those of you who don't know where it is, we're ending, we'll be in Matthew chapter 7 for the duration of the thing. But the Sermon on the Mount is from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. We've been going through a series on, on Sunday nights called Pursuing Perfection. And we've been basing it off of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And we call it, because I have a theory, you know, I have a theory about this, that, you know the thesis statement in a paper, any of you write papers? Uh, and, or you had to write a paper over the years, and you have to put the thesis statement of what your paper is all about, and what is the point, and everything in that paper has to support your thesis statement, right? You agree with that? You've heard that? If, you don't, if it doesn't, you fail miserably, right? Ask the teacher in the back room with his phone in hand. If it doesn't, you get the points taken off. And I believe that the thesis statement of the, the Matthew, of the Sermon on the Mount, can be found in verse 48 of chapter 5. Therefore, you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. How many of you are suddenly just stressed out? <laughs> I have to be perfect? That means everything I have to do is perfect? Everything I am has to be perfect, as God is perfect? That's, 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 that, 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 I don't know if I can do that. Can't do that. But let's look at the word perfect. 
See, that's the same reaction I get when somebody says you have to be perfect. <laughs> the, and I, I want to look at a different meaning of this word, perfect. The Greek word is teleos, teleos. This word means complete. Complete. That's a different meaning than perfect. That's a different meaning in the American vernacular than perfect. Perfect means everything is shiny, pretty, diamonds, for instance, perfect. You can't crack one. You know, it's, it's gorgeous. Some women, we say, wow, that woman is perfect. Have you ever seen the movie The Fifth Element? Mm -hmm. The Perfect Being, played by Mila, Mila Jovovich. That everybody said she was perfect. She was made perfect to be the perfect being. But when we start thinking of complete, being complete, as your Father in Heaven is complete. <coughs> another just definition, that, you know, Greek words have a thousand definitions. So one of the definitions that went along this was wanting nothing necessary to completeness. To be perfect is that you want nothing necessary to completeness. What does that mean? You have all of the requirements for perfection. You have everything you need to be complete. You may not have them all in the right place. You may not have them all put together in the right order. But the box of puzzle pieces that you were given when you came to Christ are there, and you have the, all the abilities to put them together. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything that we talked about in the past six months. Or three months. How long have we been talking about? Closer to three. Three months. Thank you. Yeah, for the past three months, because y'all ain't got that time. <laughs> so we're going to hit some highlights, and then we're going to jump into our, our. Well, let's read our main text, which is coming out of chapter seven, verses thirteen through the end of, of the of, of the of the. Uh, it's called a chapter here. It's a chapter. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come into you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'm going to stop right there, because I want to save that last part for later on. In there are some of the principles we've been gathering over the past three months. And those of you who have been with me, you, I see head shaking. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Some of the principles we are talking about uh, is showing God through the things that we do. One of the things we've noticed, and the, one of the things I want to point out is in earlier in chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, God tells us that you are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone hide a lamp under a bushel, but on, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. You are a light. You are not going to be a light. You don't have to force yourself to be a light. You are a light. You're a reflection of the light. And your light can't point to you because verse, uh, to, to K 
counteract that, I'm going to read verse, chapter 6, verse 1, which says this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. They almost contradict each other, don't they? Let your light shine, but don't let them see you. Don't do your good works so people can see you do them. You hear that? Don't say, hey, look, he, he went to a whole story about fasting, about giving, about praying. He says, when you give, when you fast, when you pray, do not do it so other people can see you doing it. Do not keep a record and say, wow, this is how many times I've prayed. This is how many times, this is how much money I've given to the poor. This is how much I've fasted. I'm fasting now. I'm so hungry. I've eaten 42 days. Can I have a burger? That's just for you. <laughs> Don't, like he, the, in closer reading, he says, when you do these things, these are things you're supposed to do anyway. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't blow trumpets. This is one of the examples is back when the, in the Jerusalem days, they used to have these huge buckets where people can, where they gave offerings and tithes outside the temple. And there were people who came in and poured bags and blew trumpets and said, I am giving my tithe to the poor. Right now, look at me, and they just pour these huge buckets of coins. They calculated brought them in pennies. They made a lot of noise. Made a lot of noise, yeah. And God says that is not how we do it. Do not do your good works so somebody can see you and do good works. But do your good works so that people will see the light and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do good works, not for you, for Him. Your focus, other people's focus when they see what you're doing, doesn't need to be on what you're doing, but on what God has called you to do. When we read chapter 7, it says, Beware of the false prophets, for they will be known by their fruit. You're going to be known by the fruit that you produce. You're going to be known by how people... Don't be known by what you do. And the results of your life is how people will know if you're true or not. If it points them to you, you're not... If, you, if, if it points people to you, if anything points a preacher to, if anything points to, I'm trying not to bash the certain what he's people. What saying is we're going to start a jet on the Yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm such a great preacher, you need to give me a, a point. Um, no, but if it points others to God, that is when you are on the right path, when you are pursuing, when you are pointing others to God. Second thing that we noticed, second highlight that I want to give, found in verse, chapter 6, verse 33. You know this one. If you don't know this one, you haven't sung this song in Vacation Bible School. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Does it sound familiar to anybody? And all these things will be added unto you. All what things? Well, he just talked about worry. He just talked about clothing. He just talked about your basic needs. He talked about what you need. And he says the way that you get all that stuff, not to get a jet, not to get a, uh, a, the best food in the world, not to get the, clothes, the, the best clothing workshop at the Abercrombie and Fitch and Gap or whatever, not to get that, but to, to get the things that you need, to get the things that you're looking for, to get the things to survive, to get the things to keep going. He says, seek first his kingdom. Pursuing perfection requires us to seek first the, perf the perfect being, to put Christ first. And he mentions it again in, in chapter 7 where he says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Seek 
me put Christ first in everything you do. Whether it's walking, waking up in the morning, going to work, going to school, brushing your teeth, putting Christ first in all that you do, seeking His kingdom first. I used to say that every life is like a pyramid. You put God first, everything else will fall into place. It's true. You put God first, everything else will fall into place. Whether you're all the stuff you're worried about, all the stuff you're concerned about, everything you want, you're, the, does the worries disappear and life is suddenly easy? No. But God is the one. Who, God is the one who fights your battles for you. God is the one who figures things out for you. God is the one that helps you in your time of trouble. He says, "You put me first, I'll take care of you. You seek me first, and all these things will be added unto you." That's pursuing perfection. Pursuing perfection basically is pursuing Christ. Pursuing completeness, finding completeness, is finding Christ. And then showing Christ. A couple things to touch on in the verses that we just read. It says, intro through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide that leads and broad that leads to destruction. We live in a world where people say in any way it gets you to heaven. Being good enough will get you to heaven. But everybody's right. We live in a world where everybody's right and then you say there's one way and they say that's a very narrow-minded way to think. I go, well, I've got a narrow-minded God. My God says there's only one way to heaven. My God says narrow is the gate that leads to light, and few find it. And he says, watch out for everything else. Pursuing perfection is not an easy road. God never said this is going to be easy for you. He says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. But life is still hard. I'm going to end with the last story. So we worked up, the band and I worked something out. <laughs> says, uh, besides, I just want to finish this the sermon on now. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, beachfront property. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell and how great was its fall. Driving down South Carolina, I was with a, somebody who knew construction and stuff, and we drove past this one place, and he said, and they were starting new construction on it. And the person I was with knew the area, and he said, wow, that is a floodplain. And they're building a house on a floodplain. What's going to happen to that house? It's going to get wet. The creek rises, and it's going to get so flooded. They better have their flood insurance. I, I bet you they could even get flood insurance for, for building a house on the floodplain. Because that's just stupid. <laughs> Don't be stupid. Yeah. God said, build your house on a, you know, we got the first thing you build to work on in a house is your foundation. And most of the foundations I've ever seen that lasted long were concrete and solid. The houses that were built on crappy foundations, the whole house has problems for the rest of its life. You get a crack in your foundation, you're, 
messed up. Not the word I wanted to use, but you know how it's going to work. You're out of luck. Christ says you take these words of mine found that I just spoke and everything that I did. You base your life on these things. And it will be like the house that's built on a firm foundation. That you will be able to grow. You'll be able to withstand everything that comes against you. Not that, And it doesn't say that you build your house on the rock and everything's going to be great. No, he said the winds are going to come, the storm's going to blow, the rain's going to fall down, and your house will stand because you built it on the rock of Christ Jesus. Anything else you build it on, if you don't listen to what Christ said, if you don't listen to this thing, then everything is going to fall apart, and you're going to be in a spot of trouble, for lack of a better term, cleaner term. You're going to be screwed. You're going to be lost. And you're going to be destroyed. Pursuing perfection. Pursuing completeness. Completeness. The box of puzzle pieces are given to you. You guys ever put together a puzzle of a, of a million, a thousand piece puzzle? I always start them, I never finish them because I have to use my puzzle table to eat off them. Um, <laughs> I live in an apartment, you only have one table. Um, I only have one table. I only have room for one table. Um, but you've been given all the pieces. You don't know how to fit them all together yet, but God teaches you that as you go. God says, trust in me, follow me, put me first, and everything else will be figured out as we go. When Jesus has finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching with them with one, as one having authority and not not putting Christ first you're not going to make it um, that's all we got let's pray Father God we thank you for today God, we thank you that you've given us everything we need to be complete. And God, you don't want us... God, God I don't think you want us to uh, have every part of our lives to appear perfect to the world. But God, you want every part of us to reflect you. God, help me to seek you. Help us to seek you first. Help us to put you first. God, help us to show the world who you are. In Jesus' name.